Okay, there we go. Now I will share the screen again. Um, that one. Okay, beautiful. Thank you for being patient with that. Um, we'll go ahead and get started because I don't think anyone else is going to join. All right, we got chapter seven, eight, and nine of wage, labor, and capital. Um, yeah, so this is from chapter seven. So the way this usually works for those who are new here, um, at least when I do it, I pick out quotes from the reading that I thought were significant. Uh, we have some questions that we discuss. And then towards the end, I just have some general questions that I thought of, um, but that's pretty much the format. Um, and this is the end of the book, right? So we've been doing this um, for a little while. So uh, the chapter seven was called the general law that determines the rise and fall of wages and profits, right? Uh, real wages may remain the same. They may even rise. Nevertheless, the relative wages may fall. Let us suppose, for instance, that all means of subsistence, um, so in other words, like food, rent, um, that kind of thing, have fallen two thirds in price while the day's wages have fallen but one third, for example, from three to two shillings. Although the worker can now get a greater amount of commodities with these two shillings than he formerly did with three shillings, yet his wages have decreased in proportion to the gain of the capitalist. The profit of the capitalist, the manufacturers, for instance, has increased one shilling, which means that for a smaller amount of exchange values, which he has, which he pays to the worker, the latter must produce a greater amount of exchange values than before. The share of capitals in proportion to the share of labor has risen. Uh, the distribution of social wealth between capital and labor has become still more unequal the capitalist commands a greater amount of labor with the same capital. The power of the capitalist class over the working class has grown. Uh, the social position of the worker has become worse, has been forced down still another degree below that of the capitalist, right? Um, so yeah, like how I summarize this is basically, yeah, like you said, even if you're doing relatively well, the fact is you're still being exploited and that, um, so they're still taking a profit off of you, right? Uh, so does anyone think of any other factors that govern the rise and fall of real wages? By real wages, we mean adjusted for inflation. Wouldn't it be like a raise along with like <clears throat> rise in store prices along with that line? Um, what, do you, what do you mean by a raise in store prices? Uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, it's really hard to explain. Uh, growing up, I was always told to like, oh, you, well, if we give all our employees a raise, then we'll have to raise store prices, you mm -hmm. know, to keep up with inflation and like that. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was trying to get at. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So like general inflation. Um, Yes, that will, will, yeah, that would be a fall of real wages because even though, yeah, even though um, your actual wages you get from work, like let's say you get paid $10 an hour, you still, hello, uh, welcome. Um, even if you're making $10 an hour, uh, the price of, it, when the price of everything in the grocery store goes up, you still make $10 an hour. That part don't change, but the stuff you can buy with that $10 has gone down. So yeah, that's definitely, um, yes, that definitely contributes to the fall of real wages. So Anyone? Are, oh, I'm not a, an economist at all, of course, and I have joined to this book club a little bit later, so I haven't uh, really dove into depth with a lot oh, of this. Um, but what, what do you consider inflation? Because I've heard inflation is... Uh, really just all corporations deciding to raise the prices on goods and services just because they can. Mm -hmm. um, and if, you know, minimum wage doesn't go up and if people don't pay more in wages, um, isn't that in a way wages going down just because your purchasing power is now less than it was you know, a year or two ago. Mm -hmm. 
uh yeah that's that's exactly what he's saying here like when, when okay. corporations raise the prices uh your share of the income goes down um yeah that's exactly what he's talking about here and also um but there's also a, a flip side to that where like uh, how do you explain it um even if, and like, let's assume the opposite. I mean, not that this ever happens, but like, let's assume prices go down, right? Um, and you can buy more with your wage. That doesn't change the, the fact that you're getting exploited by your employer. And in fact, your employer can actually um, even be exploiting you more because they're taking away more of a profit. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think I have real world... I don't know, um, just to provide my real world experience. Yes, please stuff. do. Um, like uh, my wife works at a rabies lab here in Manhattan uh, with K-State and they were hiring new people for a higher wage than um, the older people there. And they just kind of did that because uh, those the people who've been working there for a long time didn't really have much of a choice. And it's kind of like what they decided to do with their lives. Um, but it was just kind of a slap in the face of them because they're hiring brand new people who were inexperienced, younger for a higher wage. Um, and they were doing everything they could not to raise everybody wa everybody's wages, just to attract, try to attract new people. And of course, there's other bad, you know, um, terrible stuff going on there aside from that, but which is probably why they had to uh, <laughs> encourage people to to uh, apply because they were going to pay him more than the people who've been there. Um, and another thing interesting, I'll just add to this. Um, it's if you look at the prices, price change in commodities and also, um, you know, life-saving services like healthcare services, emergency services, um, cost of housing, um, all basic necessities that you need to survive, all those costs have all gone up. Well, things you don't need to live on, TVs, um, computers, you know, fun stuff, all of that has just plummeted and TVs are cheaper now than they've ever been. Um, so that's just something interesting I thought I'd add. Yeah, no, that's definitely relevant. And um, as a side note, like there's this uh, publication I write with and, and stuff. And what they want to do is they want to get letters for, they call it letters from workers, kind of like Lenin did in, in the Soviet Union with his paper. Um, he would go and, and ask like just regular workers and peasants to just like write in and in your own words, explain like what you just did to me. Right. So if you or your wife wanted to write into that and, and like um, just explain just like you did in your own words, um, like that's when what we want to do is get that out there um because that like or a lot of workers for them to hear that from like another worker in their own words is like that's very powerful um and people need to know about it so that's just oh, a yeah. side note there um but yeah that brings to the next comment about standard of living right uh so what does standard of living mean exactly Well, I think we touched. Oh, go ahead. Standard of living. Um, doesn't that just mean? Um, uh, I had it in my. So, is it just being able to live in your house with like food, like just being being able to have like the um, necessities? I guess. Uh, like I what the what the um, or at least what uh, what we would consider necessities today? I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that could be like a baseline of it, but I think standard of living like is a spectrum almost like what's the quality of life. Yeah. Um, so I, I would say standard of living is comprised of two things mostly, right? It's the uh, comfort level at which you mm -hmm. live and also the ease of accessing uh, required commodities, you know, water, food, whatever. And so mm -hmm. it, it's a combination of both of those. And that ease does factor into comfort, but it, it, it's mostly just those two things, I would say, in general, for just a general idea of what standard of living is. Mm -hmm. I think that's really well said. Um, yeah, I think that gets to the heart of the question. I think, and too, I don't know. Um, 
I kind of consider free time in a way part of standard of living Mm -hmm. because if you are, you know, your belly's full, you're dry, warm, and you're comfortable and you don't have to labor to, to live, to exist. uh, You can use that free time for whatever you want. You can use it to educate yourself. You can use it to uh, start a business if you're a capitalist. Um, You could just use it to relax, to rest. Um, And I think the more free time you have, the more advantage you have over people who don't because you can do more things um, and you're not just toiling away all day, every day, just to try to survive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so actually Mark, Mark's touches on that earlier in the book um, and that free time is itself a commodity, right? Because it is bought and sold by the capitalist. The, the, the capitalist buys it from the worker. And so the worker has a finite amount of this commodity of time, free time, labor time, or just, just time in general that they can sell. And so if you have more ready access to that commodity to sell or do whatever you want to do with, that increases your standard of living. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's actually a really good point about free time. And if we look at history of all the revolutionaries, like let's look at something that is there, well, they're all very different people from very different situations, but there's one thing they have in common and there's a reason for it, right? Mao Zedong, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, Vladimir Lenin, um, Stalin was an exception, so not so much him. Does anyone know what the what those four very different people all have in common? They were class traders. They were class traders, exactly, yes. Uh, because though they all came from um, either very well-to-do households or they came from, um, you know, like petty bourgeois, you'd say middle class, I guess, households, right? And then the reason I brought that up is because like Sam was saying, free time is a commodity. And like Noah was saying, if you have free time, you have time to develop, to learn, to study. Um, and, and so communist movements always come to be led uh, by the proletariat, the working class, and for the working class. But when they're in the stage of first getting started off, it's usually actually like petty bourgeois slash middle class people. And not always, because, for example, um, Stalin. Stalin came from a very poor household. Um, he was very, um, you know, had a very rough childhood. And it was definitely, you know, proletarian and peasant in nature. Um, but a lot of those guys, because they had the free time to pursue their studies of socialism, um, cause like we got people like, um, Martin, I know last week said he showed up and, and he said he works a lot, so he doesn't always able to show up and that's, you know, that's just how it is. Um, so that <laughs> directly ties into the development of communism, right? Presence of free time. Um, I think it's an interesting trend. Uh, this is kind of a, um, <clears throat> this might be like, just, a like, just to show where I am, but like, what does it mean necessarily to be a class trader? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Does anyone want to take a shot? It means to come from a certain a given class uh, and to betray your personal or betray the material interests of that class. So uh, a class trader to the proletariat would be like a cop. So the, the proletariat is the working class, right? Um, so the, a class trader to the working class would be a cop because they are wage laborers. They work for a living. But they protect but, the means of like the bourgeois, right? Yeah. And okay. so on the other end, you've got like Che Guevara, who was in a very wealthy aristocratic family and did not have to work for a living that betrayed that by pursuing proletarian revolution across the world. And so that's that's the kind of general idea of what being class trader is. So it's not you you're here mostly used as a bad thing, but it's not always a bad thing because again, if you're betraying the upper class, that's usually a good for, thing for most people. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've got a one real world example. Um, so it, like we have a group called Renters Together, which is just you know pro renters, and um, there was somebody running for county or city commission. And she happened to be a landlord, but she didn't, I think she's more of like a liberal and I guess she felt had sympathy on renters and 
I felt bad. And so she was pushing for rental inspections. And as a landlord, if you have true class solidarity, you would be against any kind of regulation or anything that's going to limit uh, or impede upon your power to do whatever the hell you want. And that's kind of what she was trying to do. And uh, a lot of landlords didn't like her for that. And if I think if she had true yeah, class solidarity, she would not be promoting uh, rental inspections. Mm hmm. All right. Yeah, um, that's a good mm -hmm. example. The other one that comes to mind is Frederick Engels, right? He literally owned a factory that he inherited from his father. Um, and it, it's as a side note, like he was kind of like Marx's personal ATM. Like Marx would be like, hey, Frederick, Freddie, fucking the grocer doesn't want to sell me any more meat and my kids are starving and I need to buy food. Can you just like send me some money? And Engels would be like, yeah, no problem. How much do you need? Uh, here you go, comrade. Like <laughs> they had that kind of relationship, but um, yeah, Engels was another great example because every I think no matter what if you like a Maoist or you're a, a ML or whatever, right? Like I think we can all agree that Engels was a pretty fucking amazing communist theorist and actor, act, um, activist, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, that dude literally owned a factory. <laughs> it was like a textbook definition of a bourgeoisie. Um, or as Noah said, with the example of the landlord he was talking about. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question, though. I'm glad we brought that up. Um, okay, let's go to, okay, I want to move on in the interests of moving on. Um, let's see, the general law that determines the rise and fall of wages and profits. These really titles of chapters really roll off the tongue. Um, we're still on chapter seven, though. Uh, so I poked out this quote said, but in the first place, it must be admitted that the result remains the same, although brought about in an opposite manner. Profit indeed has not risen because wages have fallen, but wages have fallen because profits have risen. Um, I'm going to like bold that one because in my opinion, that's like really important. What's that? Nope. Uh, with the amount, uh, same amount of another man's labor, the capitalist has brought about um, a larger, let me get rid of that, there we go, larger amount of exchange values without having paid more for the labor on that account, i.e. the work is paid for less in proportion to the net gain which it yields to the capitalist, right? So, given, and especially pay attention to what I bolded and highlighted here, what is the relationship of profits to wages? Well, just from personal experience, mm -hmm. um, profits, the, so wages are directly uh, like related to uh, wages because when I was always taught that like, oh, well, I mean, if your company is doing well enough, you'll... Uh, you'll get paid more or mm -hmm. in a way like that. But usually it's like, well, they want to, they want to make their profits even more. So they are going to make your wages even lower in a way. Mm -hmm. And that's what I usually, that's what I would associate with that. I could be wrong though. No, <laughs> that's, that's correct. Um, the, the, the relationship is opposite, right? <clears throat> profits go up mean wages go down because let me, annotate here oh cool i get to draw i'm gonna do yes. this because could you say the interests of capital and wage labor are diametrically opposed uh, yes that is a quote i actually bring up a couple slides that's the, later that's the um what you call it? it's the title of the next chapter yes and we are gonna wait what is that um eraser hold up draw format There we go. I've uh, listened to uh, Richard Wolf talk to talk about some of this stuff, and he says from like a economic standpoint, economists mm -hmm. uh, consider labor a you know a bad thing. It's not you know considered a uh, a means to provide a standard of living to a worker. It's just the cost mm -hmm. of labor. It's just like paying the electricity bill or paying the natural gas bill. It's something you want to reduce as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Whereas profits are good. So it's like labor bad, profit good. 
Yes. So, um, oh, no, I'm sorry. Okay, I didn't mean to cut so, you off. Oh, yeah. No, you're good. Oh. Go ahead. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say uh, that, yeah, labor is to the capitalist, again, it's just a commodity, but to the laborer, to the worker, it is everything. It's mm -hmm. how we live. It's, you know. And like, yeah, like the USA, it's access to health care. It's access to shelter. Mm -hmm. It's access to uh, food, not just any food, not just like McDonald's or, you know, not that this stuff's not tasty, but, you know, you your body really needs fruits, vegetables. Um, there's a lot of foods that are banned in Europe, but are legal here. Um, a lot of cancer causing foods. Um, and yeah, it's just access to free time. All that just summed up in one wage. Yes. Um, I'm writing out a formula here because this will um, demonstrate it, right? Um, let me see, surplus value, make sure I get the right formula here. Um, definition. I just wanna make sure I have the right formula for it. I know that's the rate of surplus. I'm gonna explain what this works in a minute. Um, definition, okay. Another funny thing I've noticed is uh, mm -hmm. anytime they're talking about businesses and like praising businesses, they say, oh my God, Amazon made mm -hmm. this much in profit or revenue, you know, billions in profit or revenue. And mm -hmm. they never, ever talk about how much workers are getting because, mm -hmm. um, you know, businesses are supposed to provide a good product, but also providing a good standard of living to the workers, like in, in mm -hmm. theory. I guess, yes. um, but it's just funny how they completely cut a, a, a very important part. They just assume like, oh yeah, of course workers are getting their fair share. They're getting mm -hmm. what they need. Yes, um, definition, okay. Yes, so basically uh, what I wanna get at here to kind of demonstrate to you is this R is the rate rate of profit is R, right? And then S is surplus value. And this is constant and variable. Okay, so I'm gonna explain what this means, right? R is the rate of profit. And the rate of profit actually declines over time. Like it's steady, it slowly declines over time, even though within industries, there's an average so this is the tendency of R right here is to go down. And so when R is going down, S is what surplus value, right? Um, surplus value is what we just referred to as profits. That's the, the kind of the fancy phrase for it, the mass of profits. So this is going down, um, but surplus value, as Mark says, profits are tend to rise, right? So like the mass of profits is going down, but the rate of profits is going up. So if this is going down and this is going up, constant capital um, that they see on the here, there's two types of capital, right? There's constant capital, which means machinery, um, like capital that you invest in, could be a factory, could be a computer, uh, could be farming equipment, anything like machines, basically. Um, this kind of tends to increase. Um, and then, so wages, have to go down is the point because this kind of stays the same over time. And, and so if this is staying the same, this is going up and the rate of profits going down. The only possible explanation is that if profits are going up and we know that the rate of profit is going down and constant capital more or less is saying constant, then the only explanation of how the surplus value can go up is if wages are going down at a higher rate then the surplus value is increasing. Like, does, does that make sense how that works? Yes. Okay. So that's kind of like, um, that's getting more into capital volume one, which I would really love to read that at some point, but that's kind of like the theoretical um, underpinning of why it works that way, right? Okay, I'm gonna clear that drawing. Um, relationship of profits to wages, we talked about that. 
yeah, does anyone have it? And and I know some people might think that, oh, I don't, I don't know, because I, I see a lot of people seem apprehensive about sharing experiences from their own work, but please don't. In fact, that's the kind of thing that I think is perfect to bring up in this discussion group, because as Mao says, uh, well, how, how do we gain correct ideas and knowledge? Does it fall from the sky? No, it's through experience and practice. Um, so does anyone want to share that with the group? Um, I guess I could say, uh, I actually, I'm going to uh, call out um, <laughs> uh, the store I work at. I work at the West Loop Dillons here in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And they have the president of Kroger come to the store all the time because the store is continuously getting a large sum of profit. So it's doing really well. Mm -hmm. um, and to accommodate, quote unquote, uh, the workers at the store, they are usually giving around 25, 50 cent raises, which is basically fuck all. Um, uh, and but like in comparison with inflation and the rise of prices they did with the products, it's you're basically getting nothing. Um, but to, I guess you could say, um, show the worker that, you know, oh, because you're doing a good job, they're going to give us a 25 cent raise or whatever. But it's it's uh, compared to the profits that that store is making, it's one of the highest grossing uh, Dylan's in the, in the country. So, wow. Uh, yeah, it's like compared to what we should be getting, um, it's absolutely fuck all. So we're actually getting way less because they raise all the prices and then we get like a discount card and it's only like 10%, mm -hmm. um, for, uh, purchases at the store, but, uh, we're actually making less money now because of the in increased, uh, price spikes within the last two years, mm -hmm. uh, uh, than you know than before even though we had less wages so that's uh that's something i've noticed another thing i wanted to mention was uh, in the last slide they were talking about uh new hires uh he had mentioned uh new hires making more money i was a a, a manager uh in wichita over a small team of about five people and i was making less money than the new hires at a certain point even though i had twice hmm. as much work um, they were paying the new hires that, uh, more money. And of course they, on all the like job, uh, like indeed job, uh, hires and stuff, they didn't place the wages there for the new hires, uh, or what they were offering new hires in their, um, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, uh I forgot, <laughs> I forgot what mm -hmm. to call it. Um, and, uh, so they wouldn't place that there because I assume they know that people that already work for the company could go and see that new hires are going to get paid at a higher rate. Um, but I found out through talking to new hires because I had to train mm -hmm. them. So it was just crazy to me that I had been working there for like four years and the new hires are making more money than me, even though I had <clears throat> way more responsibility than them. Mm -hmm. so. I, my, my example is a little less, well, I actually do kind of have an experience in both of those. So I work in an auto detail uh, supply store. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm just a graphic designer, so I don't usually have to buy products, but I like to keep my car clean. So I would like to buy some stuff occasionally. Um, I, I mean, I would say I get pretty decent raises every now and again. I got a $5 raise within like two years, which I mean, it's not bad, but um, the companies we usually buy from, they have been like, I've had to update uh, prices of our products maybe eight times in one year. It's pretty ridiculous. And it's not like small either. It's like, it's either $3, like $10, or even sometimes like $50 price increases on products that are like insane. It's usually chemicals that are raising in these prices never like actual equipment but it is it's pretty insane for the most part and uh another example i can give is um i was talking to my boss about like like previous work he would do and he would tell me he used to own a uh, construction firm and uh he was telling me he was like yeah whenever we were doing really well i'd give everyone in my company a, a 25 cent raise i'm like 25 cents that didn't seem much at all and he's like but yeah, they'd say the same thing. But then I tell them, you know, you know, add 25 cents times 52, right? You're missing out on a hundred dollars if you if you don't take that. And then I tell them the exact same thing. And they'd be like, so I'd be like, Do you not want an extra hundred dollars? And they're like, No, 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 it's fine, it's fine. So you just gotta put all that in perspective. So he's like trying to like what's the word? He's trying to like make it to where it's not as bad as it seems. 
And you really get to see that mindset working in their head. Yeah. And how much did your boss take away? Um, how mu- how yeah. much did they give themselves as a raise? <laughs> yeah. Um, I've, I've got two examples. Yeah, go unless ahead. You're, unless you're going to say something. No, no, no. Go ahead. Um, so, um, and these were all, <laughs> these are all from like uh, entry level jobs for when I worked in like college and in high school. Um, but my first ever job was at Freddy's when they just opened one up in Garden City, Kansas. And, you know, I had that mentality of, because I come from, you know, like a conservative Christian um, Republican family who was just like pro free market. Um, uh-huh. Not that they're hardcore, but it's just like, you know, everybody kind of has that belief. And so I was like, well, okay, well, I'm going to go in and I'm going to work hard and I'm going to do the best I can and I'm going to get promoted and I'm going to be successful. And um, that place was um, the main head manager used to work at a car dealership. So um, I don't know if you know, but usually car dealership people are a little bit slippery. Um, <laughs> yeah. He, you know, very good at making making sure to make a lot of money because you're they're just hiring uh, high school students and um you know we were all getting paid 725 but i was you know just happy for, for the opportunity and he, they would just pull some kind of slimy and you know awful tricks or uh, they would do stuff like when we were closing they would make the argument that oh we had to clock out because the stores closed and you agreed to work from this time to this time so you need to clock out and then we're just going to finish you know cleaning up the floors finish doing that and so they'd get a little bit of free labor and I was like obviously something doesn't feel right but mm-hmm. I guess I was I did not want to get fired from my job because I just got that job and um, I think some of the other high school students who've never had a job before um just kind of went along with it for a while wow. uh, eventually stopped because i feel like somebody called it out um that is illegal it's yeah. just like <laughs> um yeah there was a couple other stuff you know like making sure portions and the fries aren't too big and just whatever they could to cut costs and it was just like after a year of working my ass off he would hire he would promote people who were like friends with him friends mm. with the manager but not were necessarily good workers um, and then for me, uh, he only gave me a 25 cent raise. And it was just like nothing. Um, and another, just one more example is I used to work at Insomnia Cookies as a delivery driver here in Manhattan. And they would have, um, Insomnia Cookies has like events where it's like a pajama day or pajama. Yeah. Official pajama day. You're right back. So, but you can go on. Um, it, anyway, it was like these special events where like valentine's day where a ton of people would be ordering cookies and so it was just a huge event and they'd be like nobody is allowed to ask off on this event everybody has to attend or else you know you're going to get trouble you're probably getting fired um and so more people were working than normal and we were delivering and baking more product than than normal and at the end of you know working more than we usually do making more value than we normally do uh to get reward for that it was a pizza party so they would just give us fifty dollars after making all of that money they just gave us fifty dollars for to buy pizza and we could show up during a work week and pick eat some pizza in the lobby of insomnia cookies so were you guys getting paid for the event like you guys weren't like that was yeah we were getting paid for it it's okay. just um yeah it's just like you're working harder than you normally do yeah. and you're not you're not allowed to request off for those dates because they're the money making dates yeah that's messed up yeah that's I wanna, oh. oh go ahead no go ahead okay i want to throw something out there that is a little different um so i am a software pro engineer i don't like the term software engineer but uh (laughs) software engineer i guess um so with white collar work you get a lot of i write software that configures um computers and robots and so i'm kind of alienated from the product of my labor i don't i don't know how much value i produce so it's really hard to see that kind of 
uh, relationship with what I've got. Mm-hmm. Um, so even I got I got a raise last year. I got a pretty significant raise. I got four thousand dollars over the year, but it I don't know. Like I have no reference as to whether that is uh, what that relationship has to the value, the surplus value I produce for the company, ah. because I'm I'm just alienated from the product of my labor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or I'm sorry. Go ahead. Right. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think what really um, makes it hard to for workers to like um, want more. I mean, everybody wants more, obviously, but um, I think a, a big excuse is people assume, like normie people assume that your wage needs to be what it is because, and the prices of the goods and services is what it needs to, to be because it needs to pay off, you know, purchasing of the materials. It needs to be that to pay for electricity bills, pay for the rent for the building. But it's crazy that none of that, like all that stuff isn't, you know, open. Like you don't know how much uh, it costs to operate the business you work in, in terms of, you know, how much is the electricity bill, how much of my labor is going to pay for the materials and stuff like that. It's just all hidden from you. So you just have to guess you have to assume and i think a lot mm-hmm. of people assume the best instead of yeah. are skeptical yeah um so there's a couple things to that um so one is um if your company you work for is publicly traded meaning they're listed on the new york stock exchange you actually that you actually can look up the value of your labor and all that in the financial statements, right? The form huh. you're looking for is called a 10 K 10 kilo form through the SEC to Securities and Exchange Commission. And any publicly traded company, they have to, by law, um, disclose their financial statements. So you can exactly see how uh, they don't quite put in terms of, uh, oh, this is our surplus value and this is our, they call it gross income and net income and EBITDA. And all this that. Is this is how much we're exploding from our workers, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and 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 it's called retained earnings. As a matter of fact, um, you'll always see, and it usually goes to dividends, uh, shareholders, and stuff. But um, yeah, if you work for a publicly traded company, look at the books. Now, if it's a private company, meaning they're not listed on the stock exchange, um, then that's a different story. They don't have to disclose that, um, and that's con- considered confidential information. At my company, however, um, I'm I'm in the same boat as Sam. I'm technically I'm a data engineer, but big spreadsheets. That's I make big spreadsheets, and yeah, that's basically what I do. And um, we have this thing called. Oh, I don't want to put out my employer on a Zoom recording, but my employer likes to go and um, do. Uh, what do they call it? It's this thing where basically they have the books of the company are open and then each subdivision goes and they have um, like, okay, this is what your metrics that you're focusing on. Like one person might be focusing on um, cost of goods sold, COGS. So like, what does it cost to produce a thing, not including labor? So like material costs, uh, other ones want to focus on the revenue side of the house. And they, they specifically like break it down into accounting metrics and, and they kind of do the same thing with us. Like, oh yeah. And then, and then the idea is, oh, if we can see, you know, it clears up that ambiguity, um, then, you know, oh, you can earn more money for yourself by getting, um, you know, a bonus or whatever. And what it really is, is, is because all the books are transparent, you just see, okay, maybe I get a $4,000 bonus at the end of the year, which again, I'm not complaining about that. That's very nice. But then it's like, okay, well, the company made $50 million more in revenue. They didn't spend $50 million more dollars. And, and of that $50 more million dollars of revenue they brought in, uh, only $20 million of it is going to the what? 480 or so of us who are just regular employees. And then the C-suite is like 20 people, uh, you know, like uh, ex- CEO, CTO and all them and executive vice presidents and shit. So between, so among 400 people or in like 480 people, you have 20 million being distributed as a bonus. And then among that uh, remaining 30 million is going to the other, what, 
group of 20, like that's just such an, and then to be able to see that kind of uh, really highlights how ridiculous like the profit sharing is and stuff. I mean, not the profit sharing, but like how it's distributed, right? Um, and the other one I wanted to bring up, um, I used to work, I can't say the name of the company because of a non-disclosure agreement, but if you, you can figure it out and if you're smart and you put two, two together. Um, anyways, it was like a coding boot camp because um, I, I have always been interested in computers, but like I never really had a software like formal job, like a tech job, I guess you'd say like that. Um, cause when I was in the army, I did routing and switching and, and the network administration side of the house, not so much the, uh, programming side of the house. And anyways, they train you up on a tech stack. So they train you, okay, uh, we're going to place, they don't guarantee you a placement. They say, we'll get you an interview with this company. And then, um, you can go and we'll train you up on what they want you to know. And in exchange, you get like $22 an hour. Um, to work for this company and they start out to you like, oh, this is great for your career. You're getting experience, get your foot in the door. And I came across some internal documents of this company. And again, I'm not going to say which because of non-disclosure agreement, but the company they were contracting us out to paid us or they paid the company that was I was working for $65 an hour. So every hour they we worked, that company paid my company $65 an hour. In turn, the company I worked for out of that $65 an hour was giving me $22 an hour. Um, and, and some of the places, like a lot of these places, I was fortunate to have a remote job, but some of these places wanted you to go there in person and move. And, I'm, and if you know anything about where tech jobs are, Seattle, uh, the Bay Area, Washington, D.C., expensive areas. Yeah. And, and do you know, and they say, oh, we'll give you a cost of living adjustment. You know what? And, and we'll even help you move. We'll pay you to move $500 to move um, $1,000 if it's more, if it's halfway across the country. Um, that doesn't need, I'd have to break my lease. And this happened to a coworker of mine. Uh, she took them at their word and just moved. And I was like, I'm going to wait until like the last minute because, um, and she moved to fucking Arkansas um, from uh, the East, the West Coast. So West Coast to Arkansas. Uh, she didn't know anyone there. She worked there for a little bit. Um, it's Arkansas, so they didn't give her a cost of living adjustment, but you cannot move from Washington to Arkansas for a thousand bucks. You, you, you just can't. Like, I don't care. It, it's not happening. Um, <laughs> and, then, and, and then so, um, and then they just laid everyone off. Well, all the budget, whatever, and the economy, and yeah, you know, all you contractors are getting laid off. Um, and she had no recourse. Like, um, and then eventually they just laid all of us off after that, you know, um, they helped us try to find a job for a month and they said, sorry, we're cutting you loose. And, uh, so this, this poor person, you know, this poor woman was moved halfway across the country, the middle of fucking Arkansas, um, no job. Uh, you didn't know anyone there and she's just basically stranded and she's doing all right. Cause I, I would like, like, how are you doing? You know, like you need any help with anything? And I think she, she, she's, um, she's doing all right now. So that's, I'm very thankful for that, but the point still stands. And, and then, and then they say, uh, well, I said, okay, they wanted to move me to uh, Washington DC area to work on, uh, um, I think it was like Fannie Mae or some shit, some financial company. And I was like, I can't live on 22 hours an hour. I have two children and I'm gonna have to move away from those kids, which means I'm going to have to send their mother more money and like child support. Cause that's not fair to her. Um, and I'm like, well, what can you do for that? They said, oh, we can give you a raise from um, $22 an hour to $26 an hour in fucking Virginia, like, and, and like the Washington DC area. Like it's, it, you can't live on that. Like it's ridiculous with all the other bills. Meanwhile, they're pocketing $65 an hour and only, so I just wanted to bring that up because I have some instances where I can quantify that number that Sam was talking about, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and then also there's a lot of, and again, I am very fortunate to have a very good job like I do. I'm not trying to make myself painted out like the exploited proletariat, like I'm a garment worker in Swaziland, uh, not trying to say that. But what I am trying to say is a lot of people will have this false division, oh, well, white collar and blue collar. And yeah, there are some differences, but my point is, even if some workers are, whatever, are relatively better off, like we're all still exploited in some way. 
And if you're making more money as a worker, that doesn't mean that like the, the business you work for is fairer. All that that means is that your employer can afford to pay you that much and just imagine the fistfuls of money they're making. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think we probably ought to move on to the next slide. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I got on, we got on a big tangent there. Um, boom. I was about to start talking about landlords and exploitation <laughs> there. <laughs> yeah, um, this is good. This is good conversations. We said that interests are diametrically opposed. That's what Sam said. We thus see that even if you keep this is, what, this is what Sam said. Even if we keep ourselves within the relation of capital and wage labor, the interests of capitals and the interests of wage labor are diametrically opposed to each other. Um, so I like to relate things back to real life when we read, what are the implications of this for organizing? I don't know, a tenant union, for example. I feel like Noah has some thoughts on that. Uh, implications? Yeah. Organizing. Um, yes. So, wait, can you um, like break down a little bit more about yeah, that? Yeah, sure. Question? Okay. So we were talking about in the tenants union and um, renters together. Um, and, and I remember, Noah, you were saying some some people on MapJ or not even just that group, but like in general, uh, people will say, oh, well, um, you can work together with the landlords to educate the tenants and you can, um, you know, like, or what about the landlords? What's their opinion in this matter? And so what I mean by this, what are the implications for organizing? What I want to say is, okay, if these interests are fundamentally and diametrically opposed to each other, is there any room for collaboration? Is there any room for cooperation and working together? Like, what do people think? Uh, like working together with the landlord or with yeah, other uh, tenants? No, working together with landlords, excuse me. Like should tenants work together with landlords is the question I'm trying to ask. Or can workers cooperate with their employers? Uh, I think if they're a class trader. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't think there's any reason to work together to help the landlord or the employer because they already have everything you know like if you think mm -hmm. of a landlord they have the house and what are what they call investment property and they're getting you to pay it off and it's like sure you have a place to rest your head but at the end of the day the landlord could say okay we're not signing in a new lease uh you're out of here and now you don't have a place to rest your head and then the landlord not only has a house, but he has a house that's paid off and mm -hmm. has a high credit score. He's able to, he's now able to uh, borrow way more money than he has before. And he's got uh, kind of like that investment property, that house is that's now a means to extract more, you know, rent mm -hmm. from tenants, um, this time not paying off a house. And so he's getting like a ton of money um, without having to do really anything. Um, well, I guess here in Manhattan, they don't do anything because uh, landlords are incentivized not to repair homes and not to renovate. Because uh, if you know talk to anybody, they could say, oh, well, that's just student housing. Oh, well, that's just a rental property. It's not something to make fancy or good. It's just something to, to rent out. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of houses and apartments that are just falling apart because they know that they can, and they could just sell like, that. Look at that door property. that's hanging over there. Oh, you can't see, you can kind of see it when it's blurred, but yeah, like the apartments and shit are literally falling apart. <laughs> yeah. Cause they're just selling. They're just trying to rent out space to, to sleep, to rest your head. Like they're just meeting the basic needs, I guess they're not right yeah yes and 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 that's that's what i think what separates socialists and communists from liberals liberals think that there can be some kind of collaboration that you can smooth over those contradictions and so what, when we read marx and we see that and we study as well as from our own experiences at work and renting and whatnot you can see that that's not true there is no compromise here so when we or, or the implications for organizing in my opinion are we don't cooperate with landlords. We don't cooperate with uh, management, maybe not management, because I understand there's different layers to it and shit, but 
like generally speaking, we don't, we, we don't, you know, um, no, I remember you told me there was someone on the city council who said, oh, well, what about the landlord's opinion of the housing yeah. situation? <laughs> we don't give a shit what the landlord's opinion is. I have a question. I don't want to yeah. derail the argument or no, make you're it good. slow down or anything, but how yeah. would uh, a union or how would a union be able to create, um, well, I mean, a union has to work with like a landlord or an employer at some mm-hmm. point, right? How would, how would that be different than if just, um, if like, well, the conglomerate of employers were to talk with the landlord or all that, or, or just even um, employers? Or is it even different? So you're asking, like, um, how does that work? Because a union has to, like, bargain for a contract with an employer. Is that what you're asking? Yes, I would or, say. Okay. Yeah, I would say that. Okay. Um, yeah, like a union fundamentally has to sit down at the table um, with the employer and, and negotiate something out. Um, but that's not what I'm that's not what I'm referring to here, really. An example, a real life example of what I'm referring to is if, uh, you know, the railroad strike that happened, I think it was in December, right? Yeah, Uh, somewhere around that. It didn't happen. What's that? It didn't happen. Oh, no, um, you're right. Yeah, it didn't happen. But that's when it was, that was when it was in the news was what I meant, right? That was when it was, um, and when that is exactly, it didn't happen. The union management caved in, um, even though the rank and file of that wanted to, you know, they wanted to do a strike, but then they um, caved in to the demands of capital. From, I understand like the, the government was saying this is illegal to do that. But like, that's the point is like, OK, then you go on strike anyways, because, you know, the only unsuccessful strike is. Uh, or the, yeah, there's the only illegal strike is one that's not successful. You know what I mean? Um, so on, on unions and with negotiating with bosses and landlords and whatever uh first of all it is not collaboration to negotiate because it's negotiations are intentionally antagonistic necessarily antagonistic uh but also we you weren't i don't think you're you were here for when we read uh reform and revolution but in that rosa luxemburg talks about the unions and how while they do help the day to day, they like they help get reforms. They can't necessarily transform society because they do rely on the existence of you. To have a union, you need a boss to negotiate with. So there is some element there that the unions can't fully transform society, or you know, landlordism. Um, they're good. Don't get me wrong. They're, they're really good for the day to day, but yeah, they do require, there is some element there of mutual uh, requirement where the union needs a boss to negotiate with. And so at some point there is a potentially uh, reactionary regressive streak among unions, because if the bosses aren't there, who do they negotiate with? Um, and if they're not fully revolutionary, they're not prepared to answer that question. All righty. I appreciate the, uh, appreciate the response. No, that's a very good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, in the interest of time, I think I want to move on to the next slide. I think we hit the point there. Uh, interest in capital wage late. Yeah. So growth of, um, productive capital, uh, I'm trying to keep in the interest of time here. So productive growth of productive capital and rise of wages, are they really so indissolubly united as bourgeois economists maintain? We must not believe their words. Um, we do not believe them even when they claim that fatter capital is the more will its slave be pampered. The bourgeoisie is too much enlightened. It keeps its accounts much too carefully to share the prejudices of the feudal lord who makes an ostentatious display of the magnificence of his retinue. Uh, the conditions of existence of the bourgeoisie compel it to tend carefully to its bookkeeping. We must therefore examine more closely the following question, in what manner does the growth of productive capital affect wages, right? Um, so I guess let's uh, say, first let's, let's answer like, in what manner does the growth of productive capital affect wages?
I'm sorry. Can you go ahead? Can you reiterate uh, productive capital or define? Yeah, yeah, sure. Again? Okay, um, so productive capital is like machines and stuff. Um, like I um, think of an example. I own a factory that produces, I don't know, we'll call them widgets. Um, productive capital would be like the machine that manufactures the widgets. Um, so I don't have a super specific example because my labor, like Sam said, is also very alienated. Um, okay, I think I get what you mean. Um, yeah. So it's, I think it affects wages as in, you know, you're, as a worker, you're competing against machines mm -hmm. in this relationship because you yourself are considered uh, a commodity just like the machine mm -hmm. um and it just made me think of uh i heard like back then people would actually go into they get really pissed off because they mm -hmm. a lot of the work was replaced by machines in the industrial revolution and so people would organize and go to factories and destroy the machines because it took their jobs um mm -hmm. So I think it, I think sometimes it has, um, there's like positive things, like there's a new computer app or program that kind of makes your job a little bit easier, mm -hmm. but it's sort of like this existential like uh, threat where, or if that's the right way to say that, mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's like this looming threat of, you know, your job is slowly getting easier and easier and easier and you're doing less and less work because of all these machines, apps, and programs that uh, you could be afraid. Um, you know, like that scene in Office Space where it's like your employers are going to sit that you sit you down and be like, "Okay, what do you do here?" And then if they can either um, eliminate your job or mm -hmm. ship it overseas, they will. <laughs> and so, um, or just give it to a machine. Um, so I think it affects wages as in it can eliminate wages. I don't know if I've ever heard or have experienced somebody, somebody's wage or position's wage getting lowered because of, like, I'm sure there it has, but um, yeah. I think, I guess uh, what I, what comes to mind is like uh, Starbucks and like grocery store workers where it's like, I'm sure back then they had a harder job because they didn't have all these machines and computer programs. So you have to like physically count change. You have to uh, record uh, things. And like now that you have computer apps and programs, you can just quickly push buttons uh, and things are kept track via like barcodes and uh, stuff like that. So that's um, what I what comes to mind. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's all true. Um, and I think what he's trying to say here is like, um, how do I say it? Like, yeah, like even if the wages go up, like the um, you're still being exploited. And in fact, the exploitation can, in fact, increase um, just because the, the mass of profits. I, I think that's what he's trying to get at here. Yeah, and people with these like the the growth of productive capital, um, the position isn't as difficult, and it doesn't need as much you know training if you're just pushing a button or just like pulling down a lever. Mm -hmm. So then it's like, well, a high schooler could do your job, or a you know somebody with just a barely any education or experience because mm -hmm. all you're doing is pushing those buttons. So it kind of almost devalues the. It position does. even though even though you're producing like way more and doing way more way faster yeah why, why does disney need to hire um graphic artists when they should just go throw up um what is that called like journey uh the, the 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 ai that generates images like well now we don't need to have a graphic design team we can just go and uh you know I heard that's a, a booming industry now people are like frantically urgently hiring for positions who know how to work with the ai yes like they that. are they are, but what about the people whose job is to be the graphic designer? Like for them, it kind of sucks. And so, and that that's the another point I think Marx is making is like, yeah, this, and maybe for some sets of workers, the wages go up, but like for a lot more, uh, their wages go, go down or the positions are eliminated altogether. Um, so this... <clears throat> ties back into the the fall of real wages with 
the increase of profit, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, I was just that's something I want to point out. But then also, uh, I want to say that this is why wage labor, like the system of wage labor, necessarily inhibits progress. Mm-hmm. Um, because if people are, you know, scared of technology taking their jobs, technology that could, if there, if wages weren't an issue, could really improve the lives of everyone. Mm-hmm. But we need to fight against it because we need our wages. That progress, technological progress, and the rights of workers are just antagonistic in mm-hmm. the system of wage labor. Uh, yeah, I yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, an example I think is um, you think of an example with AI specifically. A lot of uh, so this this whole AI generated art thing has understandably uh, made a lot of people very angry. Uh, they're very fearful of like losing their jobs and stuff, and that's perfectly reasonable. But like Sam was saying, in turn, people just oh, therefore all AI is is bad and 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 we should be discarded and. Um, and, and, you know, that it encourages that attitude when in reality, like there are some good applications of it, for example, to give you one example, um, machine learning algorithms can be trained to be more effective than like medical doctors with medical degrees, um, who've been practicing for decades. It can be more effective than those doctors at identifying lung cancer, just based on putting, giving it an image of like your x-ray of your chest or whatever. It can be more, but, but people will blanket discount that. And I'm not trying to negate anyone's frustrations or invalidate anyone, but like, yeah, it's like Sam said, that encourages and, and inhibits the development of human interests um, because everything is tied into wages. Um, yeah, I want to go on to the next one because I want to get through this. And I told my kids we'd go get uh, some pots and then plant these seeds in the ground. Um, they got from school but anyways um let's see oh yeah this one was really important right i'm not going to read the whole quote i'm going to read this highlighted part right here so he could he being the capitalist could uh, keep on selling half a yard of linen at old market price but this would not have the effect of driving his opponents from the field and enlarging his own market but pay attention to this part but now his need of a market has increased in the same measure in which his productive power is extended and you can read the rest of the quote there. There's a reason I brought that up, right? Is what do capitalists do once, I don't know, the domestic market for um, things runs out? Uh, what do you do there? Like, what happens? So you're like saying like, oh, if, um, and this is just an example, not like actually true, but like, oh, mm-hmm. we ran out of coal or oil. Um, they in, Here in the US, they go somewhere else to get it. Yeah. Yes. And it also works the opposite way too, where, oh, we just produced a bunch of this stuff. Um, and, and we produce so much of it that no one is going to buy it now. So where do we, uh, how do we sell what we have on hand? Cause if you can't sell your commodities, you can't realize the profit. I know what they do if they produce too much is when it mm-hmm. comes to like food, they throw it away, mm-hmm. they destroy it. And they don't only throw it away. They douse it in like bleach and uh, that's what we did in Somni cookies is we would always have extra cookies at the end of the night, but it was against the rules and you'd get, you know, in trouble or punished for it at work. If you ate cookies that were supposed to be thrown out um, or, and you're not allowed to give them out to people. So it's just, mm-hmm. it sometimes gets destroyed. Mm-hmm. Same thing with Amazon and computers produced to like, uh, I saw a video about like, um, Oh, I think tech, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, tech companies yeah. will just destroy their computers and throw them up in landfills. Uh, Perfectly they, good. Too many of them. Yeah. Perfectly Cars. good computers. All that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so either they just completely destroy it or um, I was thinking like <clears throat> with uh, the British market, uh, to use a historical example, uh, they had too much opium, right? So they literally went into China and created a new market for opium, which as you can tell from the opium crisis we have in the United States in 2023 is nothing good comes of that kind of market. So um, 
Yeah, they like they export it. They create markets overseas, whether because they need to bring in raw materials or they produce too much of something. And that process of creating markets is uh, we either call it colonialism or imperialism, um, which that's another topic I would love to discuss as a group. That's a very violent process. It has a lot of horrible consequences. Um, and in China, it was particularly led to wars, like two wars called the Opium Wars. And then once Boy. the communist revolution was successful, that was like one of the very first problems that they had to address in, uh, in China was like, how do we deal with this widespread addiction? And they, they did because it's, it's not a problem anymore. Like the communists were able to resolve that. But um, that's yeah, like that's that's <laughs> it's, creating markets is a very violent process. It makes a lot of sense when um, why uh, the U.S. would hate China and Russia and countries that are trying to nationalize their oil or nationalize their uh -huh. lithium because that's less markets. And I guess for in terms of the U.S., you know, the government, mm -hmm. um, that's less power because if Exxon Mobil goes to so and so country and starts buying up their oil, well, it's a U.S. company and. Mm -hmm. it's kind of in a way u.s power uh because i'm pretty sure u.s gets a good amount of tax money from that too mm -hmm. um yeah um and 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 well we we talked about this in an earlier session i don't think you're here for but to, to summarize the way imperialism works is that the united states produces very technologically advanced finished goods uh we manufact we assemble cars in the united states we assemble, uh, well, actually something like 20% of our industrial base is dedicated to weapons manufacturing. So we assemble missiles, bombs, tanks, um, but we don't go and, and actually get the raw material, or in the case of me and Sam, we develop software coding that's very abstract away from anything physical. But all of that relies on raw materials to be imported. Uh, in the case of computer silicon, um, is, is a big one. Gold for the, the resistors and the circuits. Um, cars need iron. They need aluminum. They need uh, rubber for the tires. Um, our military equipment, night vision goggles, for example, and tritium uh, scopes require very rare earth metals, um, uh, magnets, and, and, and lithium is another big one because everyone wants electric cars. The point is, Imperialist countries import raw materials and export capital goods, um, advanced goods. And then and the converse of that is the colonized and imperialized nations. Uh, they export all of their raw commodities. And that raises the question, OK, well, if all the iron, I don't know, all the iron and all the gold and all the textiles are already in Swaziland, why does Swaziland have to uh, export all that and then re-import the finished goods? and pay dearly for it when they already have the raw materials, they could just build it themselves in their country, you know? But that would not be profitable to the imperialist world powers. Um, so therefore it does not happen that way. And when people like, I don't know, Evo Morales in Bolivia try to nationalize their lithium mines, <laughs> that's when the CIA comes in and, and, and stages a coup. And thankfully they were able to reverse that. It was a very positive development. Um, yeah, that's the main point I wanted to get at with that slide. Um, uh, two things. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I forgot one of them, actually. One thing I wanted to say is when developing new markets becomes too expensive, mm -hmm. um, or you have conquered basically every market. So think Facebook, right? Facebook is in pretty much every country, except for like China and Cuba and the DPRK. Uh, but they've essentially got the entire world market. They've got no more markets to expand to. So what did they do? Well, they created the metaverse. They invented a new market out of thin air to try and uh, you know, keep making money. Uh, and so that I, I see as kind of, I guess a lesser form of imperialism because there's no mm -hmm. real export import going on. Well, I, I mean, with the technology needed to support it, yeah. But if it's all digital goods, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, that's actually a really good example of creating the metaverse. Um, 
because the underlying of all that at the end of the day is like cloud computing, which is is all based on like hardware. So I guess in terms of raw materials, that's very, very, very resource intensive. Like, mm -hmm. um, and, and so I guess in that sense, um, the uh, but Sam, you raise another good point where either they create a new market by inventing it out of thin air or um, they create a new market by just completely destroying shit to start all over again. And from a materials perspective, uh, this could be considered part of the rise of fascism in Germany, um, particularly when uh, German, uh, the Nazi party wanted to expand eastward and literally eradicate all of the Eastern European population to resettle it with, um, you know, it would have been German settlers. Thankfully, they were never able to complete that. But like, that's the material drive behind that too, is like, oh shit, we have reached the limitations of, um, you know, where we're able to expand and therefore we're going to go fucking uh, do genocide to repopulate the Eastern half of this continent and eventually the world. Um, and, and that's, so that's like, yeah, it's logical conclusion can be something like the metaverse or it can be a fucking, the Holocaust um, is very much tied into this desire to expand markets. Um, and that's why wars happen a lot of times too, right? Um, I also think it's, they're um, trying to host a marketplace too, because if you mm -hmm. think of uh, Walmart, Amazon, and the metaverse is uh, one thing that I think, you know, metaverse, I don't know for sure, but I assume they would just do this too. But uh, I kind of like what Amazon does is they create a platform. So instead of you having to physically go to this uh, brick and mortar business, you could just order that stuff on their marketplace through them. And they are collecting all of this information on everything that's being sold on their marketplace. And what they do is they find the most popular items and they make their own version of it, kind of like how Walmart makes their own version of it, but it's cheaper and they can push that instead of others. And I'm sure that's kind of something what the metaverse would do is it would, it's trying to be the first of its kind and really push it and so you know you could create your own games or spaces on the metaverse sure but the metaverse is going to have all kinds of data and information on what's going on in the metaverse and they're probably going to produce their own stuff and push their own product so it's kind of like creating a marketplace but it's your marketplace to control and manipulate um yeah that that, that there's truth to that but um i, I just want to push back against that a little bit uh, yeah, go ahead. Believe it or not, Amazon does not make a lot of money from the Amazon marketplace. That's not their main business model. Um, okay. So, I mean, what you said is true uh, to a degree, but um, I just wanted to clarify, like, Amazon makes most of their money because they control, like, think about 40 to 40 to 50 percent of the physical and virtual infrastructure of the Internet, like websites. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, uh, and a lot, a lot of people don't realize it because it's all on the back end, right? But there's something called AWS, Amazon Web Services. That is Amazon's real money maker. Um, that that is, uh, and and the um, I guess what started out as a marketplace like that. Um, but yeah, that also has to do. Uh, you bring up a really good point about data, but I just wanted to say that because. Yeah, I don't, I don't think a lot of people realize Amazon doesn't make most of their money from buying and selling things online. They make it from literally controlling the physical infrastructure of everything on the internet, which okay, is yeah. scarier when you think about it that way, that one company owns all that. Yeah, that's what was scary about the metaverse because they were like trying to push, oh, you're going to do all your work and all your play mm -hmm. in the metaverse. And yeah, it's just like the – it's one thing to – to exploit people through just like a product and but it's another thing to exploit the people and other companies by controlling a marketplace or they, just like hosting the marketplace they don't make all that much money off of the selling goods and yet they're still i guess that makes sense though because if they don't not making as much money the wages are going to have to be lower to keep the rate of profit up and, and so, so they're treating their employees in the warehouses like shit. And mm -hmm. I, that makes sense, given what we've just read. Yeah. 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 Cause they, they literally have to track their 
bathroom breaks down to the second to <laughs> maximize productivity. I'm going to move on to the next slide just in the interest of time here. Um, okay, we kind of talked about that techniques of production. Um, oh, this is a good one we should discuss. Uh, the contrast between labor intensive and capital intensive industries. Anyone have a thought about that? Can you just define uh, labor intensive and capital intensive? Yeah, just yeah. Quick? So capital intensive industry would be something like Sam and myself do, where we have, um, it, it's all relies on like computers and stuff like physical infrastructure. Uh, at least for me, I guess Sam's probably a little bit different, but my job all relies on big data that is stored on these physical servers, right? So even though there's like a team of maybe two of us, we're dealing with like about an, um, petabytes of data, a petabyte being 1,024 terabytes, which is a terabyte is 1,024 gigabytes. So that's millions upon millions of gigabytes of information uh, that is all hosted on very expensive computers, but not a lot of labor goes into it. Like you only need two people to, to handle all that data. Oh, by labor intensive industry, we mean something like um, Theo was talking about how they work at Kroger. And um, that's like a, um, that's very labor intensive. Like you can't, I mean, in some, in some respects, they do automate grocery stores because you have the automatic checkout machines. But even then, you know, you got to have someone to fix them and stuff. You have to have all the people in the back to, to stock all the shelves and everything. You have to have someone to man that or, you know, staff the counter at the deli and so on. Um, I think the first thing that comes to mind with labor intensive is uh, if you see like farm workers in California yes. where mm -hmm. it's like, oh, you can get paid, but you get paid by like the bushel of celery or the amount of strawberries you pick. And so they're mm -hmm. literally bent over all day trying to pick as much food as fast as possible because yes. it depends on how fast they work. And yeah. And, and, and then, oh, go ahead. I mean, I, I don't. <sighs> I, I couldn't really get a good example of like capital intensive, but I would think like a lot of retail work, I would definitely say is labor intensive. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I don't cool. see so, that being more capital intensive later on. Um, I mean, it maybe. is, it is, it is more labor intensive. What, what, but how, why do you think that? Uh, I mean, you have to be there physically. Uh, you have to do, you have to be there physically. You have to stock shelves. You have to talk to customers. You have to ring them up, all that kind of stuff. I mean, of course, you have self checkouts and all that, but I mean, they still have to get a hold of the product, which you have to stock and all that. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think no. there's a mental component too, because there's some things that aren't like you're not lifting really heavy objects or, you know, scrubbing or sweeping really hard, but you're, you know, you have to be super. <laughs> attentive and focused and mm -hmm. you know if you're working retail you got to be in a positive happy friendly awake mood for like eight hours a day and that is super straining uh mentally yeah it's emotional labor like that yeah. phrase has gotten twisted around a lot but that's originally uh noah what you just said about having to keep a positive attitude that's like the textbook definition of that phrase um it is exhausting i've done customer service before and, and you have people calling in, like when I was working IT support help desk and people call in and, and, and it's like, you're the face of the company and, yeah. and there's all kinds of things that are going wrong and they want to just fucking vomit negativity out on you. And they're just like one, you know, they're just, and there's people out there who are just ready to report you or, uh -huh. you know, complain if you're not like a hundred percent, like happy and cheerful or yeah. yeah or they even you like their therapist yeah <laughs> i used to work at a old chicago as a server so yeah there was a lot of emotional labor there <laughs> mm -hmm. who was trying to speak earlier oh so i was i was going to say that in the modern day it seems like capital intensive industry capital intensive like work mm -hmm. businesses are more likely to be productive industry stuff that's making the commodities we need whereas mm -hmm. labor intensive are services you know it's i mean this is a generalization and of course you've got labor intensive uh, labor intensive productive industry like farming or capital intensive uh, service industry like programming yada 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 but uh 
the productive industry is very much capital intensive now. Mm -hmm. it, it really requires all the machinery and the investment and whatever that you need to make this big stuff. And yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, no, I think that's like, that answers the second part of the question. I think that is the distinction. Would you consider a crane operator capital intensive because they're operating this huge machinery that's very expensive and they're performing work through that capital um, to like lift very heavy objects, doing mm -hmm. things that people can't do themselves? Yes, you know, if that's I'm trying to lift. a classic example. Okay. I think most parts are, are like, I don't know, I've seen many many parts of the economy becoming more capital intensive um with just like robots trying to um even in like the retail economy if you've seen like those robots roaming around grocery stores not mm -hmm. that they're like successful now but or like at mcdonald's where um you've got um a lot of robots or just i guess never mind I guess uh, it's more you doing the labor because you're taking, I was thinking of those like McDonald's screens where you like put in your order yourself instead of talking mm -hmm. to somebody, mm -hmm. I guess um, in some ways um, a lot, some businesses like McDonald's put the labor on you to do more labor to, to get what you want. Like yeah. you know, taking your own order. Outsource it to the customer and then you don't have to yeah. pay them. That's a good observation. Um, I want to move on to the next slide. We're almost done. We got, two more after this. Um, okay, so effect of capitalist competition on the capitalist class, uh, middle class and the working class, right? Um, let's see, let me see what I got here because we're going on an hour and a half now past that. Um, okay, we can skip that one because we already did it. Okay, so I'll, I guess we'll just wrap it up with these questions here. What is this one? Um, yeah, we'll just, so discuss the prospects for wages in your country at the moment and what tactics could be used to improve wages. So yeah, I guess like what what industries and stuff, are there any industries where wages are rising um, and, and what do those industries look like? And I guess on the flip side, where are wages look like they're going down or being stagnant? Are there sectors <sighs> where wages are increasing? I I can't um, think of a single one. Usually the I, example would be tech workers, right? I mean, yeah, that was always a not even within tech workers, though. I know within data engineer it is just because it's like the hot new job or whatever. But yeah, like even even within tech, like they just literally fired, what, two, three hundred thousand tech workers from giant companies. Yeah, I don't know. That there are any sectors with increasing wages right now. Yeah. I kind of, it kind of worries me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, th damn. When you put it that way, um, wow, <laughs> that's so sad. <laughs> just, just, I guess we all knew it, but to say it out loud is another thing, right? Um, yeah. So how how do we reverse? How do we reverse that? I think there is kind of an illusion that wages have gone up because if if you know here. Manhattan, my experience um, with like COVID and everything, there was that, you know, oh, nobody wants to work anymore, mm -hmm. where people were quitting their jobs, and um, they didn't want to go back to their shitty retail jobs, and they weren't as desperate because they had a little bit of stimulus money. Mm -hmm. And then um, you, you, yeah, you, of course, you've seen all over social media, nobody wants to work anymore. And it forced, you know, like McDonald's and Taco Bell and Panda Express to raise wages to like eight dollars and then finally like maybe twelve dollars but so it looks like wages have gone up but if you yeah were to tie that in with inflation and the rising cost of everything it's not really going up or not really going up in a significant way yeah nominal wages have increased over the past three four years since covid especially but real wages are absolutely not Real wages have stagnated and they have, I mean, real wages have been stagnant mostly for 
if you look at a general like average of the entire U.S., real wages have been stagnant since like Reagan. Mm-hmm. And, well, productivity has skyrocketed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, I actually think I'm going to go with uh, my questions here. Um, so this one says, but even if we assume that all who are directly forced out of employment by machinery, as well as all of the rising generation who are waiting for a chance of employment in the same branch of industry do find a new job, are we to believe that this new employment will pay as high wages as the, did the one they lost? If it did, it would be in contradiction to the laws of political economy. We have seen how modern industry always tends to the substitution of the simpler and more subordinate employments for the higher and more complex ones. How then could a mass of workers thrown out of one branch of industry by machinery find refuge in another branch unless they were to be paid more poorly, right? So yeah, he's basically saying here, um, yeah, like, like so you'll, you'll hear some people say with AI, for example, they say, oh, uh, this might put a bunch of people out, but it'll create new jobs. Give me one second. It'll create better jobs, or. <laughs> hmm. But yeah, but f- for the rate of profit to try to try and keep the rate of profit the same, that inherently the new jobs can't pay better because it's because the they need more surplus value to be created. Hmm. Or, and so they can't wages can't get better if yeah like like we just read wages can't get better if the if you're hopping from industry to industry yeah um okay i have to go uh if everyone wants to continue the discussion on the discord server that's you're more than welcome to do that i have to close up zoom i have to go um yeah my kids are getting a little antsy so we're gonna go do some fun stuff and go plant some seeds and pots and cook some lunch. So um, everyone have a good day. I'm going to stop sharing now. Like I said, feel free to continue the conversation in the